thank you all for uh, being here today uh, to join with us in another time of being before God to learn something from his word. I want to just start by reading from the Bible and we're going to read in 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 23 and verse 11 and 12. I'm just going to read to you from verse 8 <coughs> which introduces this passage in the Bible. It says these are the names of David's mighty warriors. Then you get down to verse 11 and 12. In the list it, it says next to him was Shammah the son of Agi the Herarite. When the Philistines banded together at a place where there was a field full of lentils, Israel's troops fled from them. But Shammah took his stand in the middle of the field. He defended it and struck down the Philistines and the Lord brought about a great victory. <clears throat> and I'm not sure that how much action I would take to defend a field of lentils. <laughs> This man is in the Bible because he defended a, a field of lentils. Just a little crop in a little field in a little country. He's one of David's mighty men. His bravery is right near the top of the list. But I wanted to talk to you about this today because surrounding us in the world in which we live today, there are things going on that in some way mirror these events. <clears throat> I want to talk to you briefly just about the world situation and then we're going to focus on Bible situations and our situation. So the world situation, what's filling the newspapers and the radio programs and the TV news items now? That Russia has decided it's going to just take part of the land of Ukraine and make it Russian. It's called annexation. They've annexed, they've taken part of the, the land that belongs to Ukraine and said, no, that's Russian. They said there are Russian speaking people that are already living there. We're going in with our bombs and our weapons and we're going to protect them because they belong to us and we're going to take the whole territory. And that's called annexation. It's not so far different from what you read about here, where the Philistines had come against Israel and Israel found itself with a land grab going on by the Philistines. And who's going to protect it? And who's going to stop the Philistines coming and taking it away? Now, you know, in our global situation today, that the Ukrainians decided to defend their territory and they've tried to push back and they've tried to push back. And if you look at the map, often on the news items, they'll present a map and you'll see it probably colored red where the, the Russians are, are trying to come in or colored pink. Where, or, or a different colour, where the Ukrainians are pushing back, pushing back, and they're trying to defend their territory against annexation. You know, it's rather strange to me that China has been a little bit quiet, and Russia has tended to sort of say, well, we can do whatever we like, and when the rest of the world gangs up against them, China's been rather quiet. And if China had come out against Russia, you'd have probably said, well, Russia would have to back down. Hmm. And you start asking yourself, why would that be the case? What's, what's China trying to defend here? And even more interesting, I don't know if any of you do history in your school, you younger people, hmm. or when you were your students, or perhaps you've got a, an interest in that, that his, history. But if you go back to the 19th century, in the 1800s, you'll find that Russia and China had a bit of a falling out. Hmm. What had happened, just to give you a, a quick background before we get into the more important aspects of our talk today, what had happened is the British and the French and other countries had seen a huge market in China for drugs, <laughs> opium, and they were selling it firstly by the cartload and then by the, you know, the big, the big boatloads until thousands of tons of opium was finding its way into China. <laughs> And the Emperor of China didn't like it at all. He could see what the negative effect, just like today, the negative effect that drugs have on people who take them. And so the, the Emperor came out with an edict and said, it's illegal this trade, I'm not going to have any more of it. And the British were losing money because they were not able to sell. So they said, send in the army. And so they did. The British and others went in with their armies against China 
to try and secure the right to continue to sell opium to them. <laughs> and they won. <laughs> there were two sets of wars called the Opium Wars, the first and the second Opium Wars in the 19th century. Mm. And the end result of that is Britain annexed Hong Kong. <laughs> so when you hear about big fuss about China trying to take back Hong Kong and say it's part of China, just remember that the reason why Hong Kong is seen to be sort of deserving special interest is because Britain <laughs> annexed it, <laughs> took it. They didn't ask the people of Hong Kong if they wanted to be <laughs> part of the UK, but they said the UK government's going to control you. Is that all right? But, right, we've annexed you. And not only Hong Kong, but other places in China too, because they'd won in the war and China had to concede defeat. They were not strong enough to oppose the superior weaponry of the European nations. Mm. So China lost Hong Kong by the annexation that was done by the UK. After the wars weakened militarily, Russia took advantage of it. And they came in at the north end of China. And there was a nice strip of land on the north part of China. You had a, a part of the, 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 the country was called Manchuria. And to the north of, of Manchuria, there was a part of China that led out to the Sea of Japan, the coastline of the Sea of Japan. Russia went in and annexed that. So they annexed part of China in those days. The Chinese didn't like it, but they were forced into accepting a treaty with the Russians. And the Russians got out of Manchuria, and it's still theirs today. Still under their control today. It gives them access to those northern ports. China is sitting back at the moment and watching Russia do the same thing with parts of Ukraine. How long will it be before China says, now it's our turn? Well, right now the situation is complicated because China may not want to support the actions that it sees Russia taking. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, it may want to do the same thing itself because just off from the coast of China is the island of Taiwan. And there, China wants to annex Taiwan <coughs> and say, it's always been ours. We're going to send in our military. We're going to take it over. Mm. So how can they criticize Russia on one side of the country if they want to do the same things themselves? You see how complicated these things get? Mm -hmm. But what is it? It's all these arguments going on. And who's going to stand and defend the territory? Well, the Russians may have been surprised with the defense that Ukraine has put mm. up. Now I want to do some more reading with you and then I want to talk about how this applies in a church sense today. So let's just read in our Bibles a series of, of passages. The first one is in Matthew chapter 21, Matthew chapter 21 and verse 43. Just to give you the context, Jesus is speaking. And the context is, he's, he's been talking about the fact that Israel, the nation to which he belonged as a human being, had rejected him from being their king. And then he comes and he says, in verse 43 of Matthew 21, Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people or a nation who will produce its fruit. The kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation producing its fruit. Please try and remember that. We're just going to go on. John chapter 3. John chapter 3. And we'll start at verse 3. This is the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus, the leader of the Jews. Jesus replied to him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they can't enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Now go to Acts chapter 8 
Acts chapter 8 and verse 12. In this passage, it's an evangelist called Philip who's been preaching. And it says that the result was that people believed what he said, which is great. And you get down to verse 12 and he says, But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. He proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. You've got to see those two things as together. Now we've got more reading to do. I'm just going to defer it just now and just make the point that what the Bible is concerned with is not so much Ukraine and Russia, China and Russia, UK and China and those kind of things. It's concerned about this little territory in the middle of the earth, so to speak, from God's point of view, Israel, the land of Israel. It's the promised land that's called that in the Bible. It's the land that God promised to Abraham and to his children and his descendants. And he said that it was going to be theirs. And you know what? If God is the creator and he made this whole earth, then he can give it to whoever he wills, can't he? So he's got right and title to it. It's all part of his kingdom and he can give it to whomever he wills. And he says, I'm going to give it to you, your children, Abraham. Abraham wanted to see it happen. It happened in successive generations and God repeated the promise again and again. This is the land that I've given you. I've promised it to you. When you get down to the man called Jacob, God changed his name from Jacob to Israel. And J Jacob had 12 sons and each of the sons in turn became the head of a great family, a tribe. So that we had the 12 tribes of Israel, Jacob's 12 sons, their extended families, until finally there were so many of them that they were all living in this promised land. 12 tribes in one great land with a boundary line that was set by God. And what did they do with it? If we'd had time, we could have read about the way that the nation developed in the days of the judges, in the days of the kings, and we'd have got through to Solomon, David's son. David was a great king. God loved him because he loved God and did what God wanted him to do with his life. God loved him because he saw the value of things from God's evaluation perspective, not from just a, a mere human evaluation. David was a great strategist and he could see how you needed to put things in a row and get them and do them logically and sequentially to get the result that God intended. He was on the same track as God in achieving the plans of God in his day. But he wasn't going to live forever, was he? And so he asked God about who's going to take over. And one of your sons are going to be king in your place, God said to him. And Solomon was chosen as the son of David who was going to be king in David's place. And that happened. And Solomon had a huge empire and it was so profitable. He had gold mines, he had silver mines, he had people bringing in precious gems. He had riches beyond counting. Mm. Solomon was a great, great king. And he was also the wisest man that had ever lived. But he messed up towards the end of his life. Mm. He married all sorts of different women, mm. some of whom were idolatrous in their activities, their religions. And they led him astray and he went after their gods instead of the God of his father, David. Mm. So God said, I'm going to take this property that I've given you to be king over, the whole of the land with the 12 tribes. And I'm going to say 10 of those tribes can be ruled by another person, not you, not your family. And that happened. We could have read about it. And so Jeroboam, a man called Jeroboam, got control of 10 tribes in the north of Israel, to the north. And all that the son of Solomon had to take over from his father were two tribes in the south, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin alongside of it, which rallied to Judah's cause. But they did have the city of Jerusalem, which was the place where God said he had put his name. Now, when God says, I've put my name there, 
we don't really use that expression so much today. But what you've got to understand is, is that's my place where my authority prevails. What I say goes. The name of something is the authority that it possesses. I often use the illustration from my childhood days when the cops used to be out on the streets and they didn't have guns, but they had truncheons <laughs> strapped on their side. And you didn't want to get hit by one of those things, believe me. But the policeman would not have to chase you. If you did something wrong and he spotted you doing something wrong, he didn't have to chase you. He, if you started running away, he would say, stop in the name of the law. Now, if the policeman's name was John Smith and he said, stop in the name of John Smith, nobody would stop, they'd carry on running. But when he said stop in the name of the law, he meant all the authority of the law is going to be against you if you don't stop. Stop in the name of the law. God says, this is the place where I've made my name to be on this earth. Out of all the vast universe, this is the spot that God has chosen. It's very special to him. You better not mess about with this territory. And in the division of the kingdom between the ten tribes of the north and the two tribes of the south, the southern tribes got Jerusalem, the place of the name, the place where God was to be worshipped and the temple that Solomon had built for him there. So that had happened. Eventually, both the northern tribes and the southern tribes rebelled against God. They were disobedient to him. And because of that disobedience, God said, I'm going to let you all clear off this territory. Leave it alone. Go away. I'm going to send a nation against you that's going to conquer you and you're going to be taken away as captives. And indeed they were. They went away to Babylon, some of them to Egypt, but they were held in captivity. Before he sent them away, he told his prophet Jeremiah, here's the word from the Lord. After 70 years, they're going to be allowed back hmm. to this place, the place of the name, Jerusalem. And that happened too. You can see it all. You can check it out in the Bible history and in secular history. And you find all of these things happen the way that I'm telling you. So God has a property on this earth, a territory, and he expects it to be defended. David defended it in his day. Shammah was one of David's mighty men. And when the Philistines tried to take this property away, he saw that it was God's property and the Philistines had no right to it. God had given it to the Israelites and Shammah defended it. Even down to the last little field, a field of lentils. Would I have fought for a field of lentils? But Shammah saw this as being protected by God. He relied on God and he was brave and he defended the territory. People that came after Shema were not so brave and not so concerned. And they got carried away into captivity for 70 years. Then God allowed them back. Yeah. And he reestablished the kingdom based on Jerusalem. Then you get to the days hundreds of years later when Jesus comes on the scene. God had been appealing through prophets to his people of the 12 tribes of Israel to get obedient to him again and to enjoy the blessings of being in the place where God wants them to be during their lives of service of God on earth. Did they do it? Sadly, no. God sends them prophets and they kill the prophets. And he says, I will send them my son. Surely they will reverence my son. They'll listen to him. Did they listen? We read about it in Matthew 21. Because they would not accept Jesus as their king, he says, the kingdom of God is going to be taken from you and given to a nation that brings forth its fruits. Has that happened? Yes, it has. Now let's carry on our reading. First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. Although we could read a lot, we're just going to break in. <clears throat> and um, verse 8. The second part of the verse, it says, they, this is the people of Israel, they stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you, the people that Peter was writing to, people in churches like this one, you are a chosen people. Another way of putting that is an elect race. That's the way the old versions used to say it. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, 
that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We don't get into the kingdom of God today because we're so clever or because we're so brave or because we're so strong. We get there because God takes the initiative. An elect race. Now, I'm not going to be accused, I hope, of racial prejudice, but there are only two races in God's view. <laughs> there's the race of Adam and there's the race of Christ. In Adam, we're all born in Adam. We're all children of Adam. We're all naturally speaking of the race of Adam. We're of Adam's race. When Jesus came and died and rose from the dead, he started something new. And he allowed us to be born again. So we start again. And we start as part of a new race. And we're not just members of Adam's race anymore. We're now in Christ. When we, when, when we receive what Jesus gives us, salvation. When God transfers us from the power of darkness that's associated with our origins as children of Adam into the kingdom of the Son of His love. We're now under Jesus' control. We've put our faith in Him, but it didn't rely on our faith. It relied on God's giving of His Son that we might then put faith in Him. The initiative always comes from God. And so it starts off that way. And God's restarting. And it's not just, oh, 70 years and then you can go back to what you were. It's a completely new thing and it's a new start. And so Jesus spends, when he's raised from the dead, when he's with the disciples, before he goes back to heaven, he's there for about 40 days. And what's he talking to them about? The kingdom. The kingdom of God. God's kingdom. Oh, isn't the whole world God's? Yes, it is. But he's got a special place and he wants to put his name there. He wants to be named amongst them where his authority ranks supreme. And then what you've got to decide is, do you mind if that territory gets annexed? I want to read with you just a verse in 2 Corinthians 10. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Of course you've got to start with your own thoughts. But the focus of this passage is on what, you, what you're able to do to get other people to think the way that God wants them to think. When they're in rebellion, how do you deal with that rebellion? You've got to bring something powerful that's going to change their minds. You can't change their minds, but the word of God can. And so you've got to bring their thoughts into captivity to make them obedient to Christ so that they can be part of this wonderful kingdom experience that God has designed to be experienced today by people like you and me. Here we're told that even the thoughts can lead us astray. I want you to think about now the metaphor of annexation and how it starts off with, you know, the Russians are going to come against Ukraine. And they'll just take Crimea. Crimea. Well, that was 2014. Oh, we'll just take Donbass. Oh, we'll just take Luhansk. Oh, we'll just take... And this creeping annexation goes across the country. And if you let them, they'll take the whole thing. <coughs> you are part, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus, in a church of God, you are part of a kingdom that's under attack. There are people trying to take it by force. They've no right and they've no title. God's got the title and he hasn't given it to them. And they're trying to annex it. They're trying to take your position away from you, the position that you have that's God-given, the territory. And now we're not talking about Mount Forest or the, the geogra geography of this particular land. We're talking about spiritual things. You ha you're part of the territory that God wants to control in this world. Your heart and mind are supposed to be his. Your life is supposed to be, have been surrendered to Jesus Christ who died to pay for it. You've got to bring your thoughts into alignment with his purpose for your life. And you've got to go out and you've got to try and defend what he's given you so that nobody else takes it away from you. How's he going to do it? Well, church meetings aren't important. We can give up on that bit. 
what you know, I can sit at home. I can, I'm a, I can be a real good Christian and I'll just stay at home. <coughs> That's not part of God's plan for you. If you're a Christian, God's plan for you involves you getting together with other Christians in a proper church setting. Oh, well, yeah, I'll get together, you know, but don't expect me to pray every day. I mean, that's, that's asking a bit much, isn't it? I've got schoolwork to do. I've got homework to do. I've got all these things to do. I've got my sports to play. I've got all of these things to do. I've got work to do. It makes me tired. I've got to have my sleep. I've got to have my rest. What can you not see that the enemy, Satan, is trying to annex the territory that God owns in your life and in mine? He's trying to take it over bit by bit. When did you last read the Bible? Well, this morning. Good. Before that? And before that? He's going to try and get you to stop reading that because that's God's instruction book for your life. And if you don't read it, don't come and complain that you didn't know what you should do with your life and when things go wrong, that you didn't know how to understand them. Because if you're not reading the instructions, it's like every man in Canada. What do you do if at first you don't succeed? Then you read the instructions. <laughs> No, don't leave the Bible till last. Read it first. Get to grips with its content so you can see how it guides you in your life. If you don't, you're allowing the enemy to annex the territory that God has f expects you to fight for. Don't let one shred of it go. Shammah's name is in the Bible because he defended a plot of lentils. Think about the whole arrangement that God has in view for this whole world right now. And you say, well, my lot is just a tiny little one. Who am I? I don't count for anything. Shammah was prepared to defend what he knew he'd got and not let anybody take it away from him. Don't let them take away your reading of the Bible. Don't let them take away your, your prayer time with God, your fellowship with other people that are sharing in the beliefs that you have about God and about the Lord Jesus. He's put you in his kingdom. He's given you the rule book. You're supposed to be subjects. A king is a king who rules. He rules by the rules that he gives. And we're the ruled people. We're the subjects in the kingdom. Oh, Peter says, you are an elect race. Yes, you no longer look at yourselves as just wanting to get the most out of your human life as children of Adam with all of the things that the natural man strives after. You are an elect race. You're chosen in Christ. You're a holy nation. Holy nation. Holiness means unique. Unique from a moral perspective. Unique from a spiritual perspective. Nothing like it. Not to be compared or evaluated by common earthly standards. God is holy. The nation that he wants you to be part of is holy. A holy nation. Now what's the difference between a nation and a race? What's the difference between a nation and a kingdom? What's the difference between a nation and a people? I'll tell you what, it's, what it is. It's the boundary line. It's where you set the boundaries. God has set boundaries around his people and he says they're a holy nation. Inside this boundary line I rank supreme and have given it all to the Lord Jesus that he might have first place in everything. If we're not honouring God in our lives, we're ceding the territory. We're letting the boundary lines come in. Paul says to the people he's writing, you know, we're not stupid. We're not ignorant about the way that Satan acts, about the way that he does try to stop you reading the Bible, the way that he does stop you wanting to pray, the way that he does stop you wanting to be with others of the children of God and his people. We're not ignorant about the things that he does. But we've got to dis demolish the strongholds that he's trying to set up in God's territory. When you apply these things, think about them in your life. What are the things that Satan is trying to erect in your life as a stronghold for himself to control aspects of your life that should be controlled by God? That's our chore for this week. Let's pray about it together.